But today we're going to begin in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 2. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to be teaching from the Greek today because that's what I do. But in verse 2, Paul writes, and he says, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace. And if you would underline that phrase, grace, mercy, and peace. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. And here we find what you would call Paul's normal salutation, where he says, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. But in the majority of Paul's letters, he does not use the word mercy. He simply says, grace and peace be unto you. And if you read what theologians have to say, they try to give you a deep meaning on why he used this salutation. But the reason he used it is really very simple. If you're a Jew, how do you greet another Jew? You say shalom, which the Greek equivalent is arene, and that's the word that is used here. If you were a Greek, how did you greet one another? You said charis, which is the word grace. So just like a Jew greets one another saying shalom, a Greek would meet each other by using the word grace. So in this one statement, Paul speaks to the entire Gentile world, and he speaks to the entire Jewish world. To those of you that are Greeks, I say grace. To those of you that are Jews, I say shalom or arene. And in this one statement, Paul opens his letter to everyone that is Jewish or everyone that is Gentile. But in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the book of Titus, Paul breaks his normal salutation, and he inserts the word mercy between the grace and the peace. And in all three of these epistles, Paul is writing to someone who is overwhelmed by their ministry. For example, in 1 Timothy, Timothy is overwhelmed because he has just become the pastor of the church, and the church is growing so fast they can hardly keep count of how many people have been converted, how many people are coming to Christ, and Paul has written a letter to Timothy and has asked for practical suggestions on how to choose leaders, what to do with the women in the church. And 1 Timothy is a book about church organization. The church was growing. And Timothy didn't just need to hear about grace and peace, but he needed a little extra mercy for what he was facing. When you come to 2 Timothy, three years are between 1 and 2 Timothy. And in that period, Nero has burned down the city of Rome, and persecution has begun against Christians, and they have been blamed for the great fire of Rome. So just like in 1 Timothy, his church was growing very fast, by the time you get to 2 Timothy, his church is declining very fast. And when Paul writes to him, he doesn't just say, grace and peace be unto you, but grace, mercy. Everybody say mercy mercy and peace be unto you. Then when you come to the book of Titus, we find that Paul was on the island of Crete for a very short period of time, started a church there, and he wrote to Titus and said that he wanted Titus to set in order the things that were lacking. Do you remember that? The Greek actually says the things that I didn't finish. In other words, Paul's ministry was so short-term on the Isle of Crete that there were many things Paul did not set in order. And now it was up to Titus to set it in order. Yet when you read the book of Titus, you find this was not the easiest congregation to work with. Paul even said that the Cretans were lazy, gluttons, and liars. Now that was Paul's words about the Cretans. And that was Titus's congregation. And so when Paul wrote to Titus, he didn't just say grace and peace be unto you, but grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. And here we find a principle that when we're facing something difficult, Jesus tucks a little extra mercy between the grace and the peace. He's very aware of our situation. Then when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, as I besought thee, to abide at Ephesus, that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Well, if you remember in Acts chapter 20, when Paul gathered together the Ephesian elders and told them farewell, he had warned them that after his departing, 
grievous wolves would enter in among them, not sparing the flock. And then Paul said, also of your own selves, looking right into the eyes of his elders, he said, some of you will rise speaking perverse things. The word perverse describes doctrine that is twisted. It's no longer straight. And the reason they did this was to draw away disciples after themselves. And just as Paul prophesied, when he left the city of Ephesus, among his own leadership, people begin to stand up who begin to allege. We've had the doctrine of Paul. We've been established in his truth. But now we have something to tell you that Paul never said to you. And their claim was that they had been out into the realm of the Spirit where they had seen things that no one else had ever seen, and they had boldly gone where no other man had ever gone before, and now they've come back from that dimension with new revelations. And these revelations were so tantalizing that people literally sat on the edge of their seats listening to these revelations. And an example of this revelation was they taught a descending order of angels. If you remember in the book of Colossians, Paul forbids the Colossian saints to worship angels. Do you remember that? That's because in the whole area of Asia Minor, they were consumed with the notion of angels and deities. And the Gnostic leaders that were emerging in the church after they had been established in doctrine by Paul had veered so far off that they begin to teach not only was their father God, but there was mother God. And the two of them got together and produced a lower breed of God who was an angel. And then they got together and produced a lower level and a lower level and a lower level and a lower level and a lower level until finally one level of God was created so low that he could actually make contact with planet Earth, and they said that was Jesus. And once you got to know Jesus, then you could get to know the figure above Jesus and the one above that and the one above that and the one above that. And eventually, if you keep climbing the ladder, you would come to meet God the Father himself. And they begin to teach this kind of doctrine. And that particular doctrine was based on Jacob's ladder because Jacob's ladder showed a stairway from heaven to earth with angels ascending and descending. So they even used Scripture to teach their false doctrine. So now Paul says to Timothy... As I besought you, this word besought is a Greek word, parakaleo, which is both a word of prayer and it is a word for the military. We find the same word used in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 when Paul says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God, the word parakaleo. It is the picture of Paul being so passionate that figuratively it's almost like he drops to his knees and he begins to pray. He begins to beg. He begins to beseech the brethren that they would hear him. And now Paul uses this word to say this is the way he invited Timothy to be the pastor of the church. When Timothy saw what was happening in Ephesus, he didn't want to be the pastor of the church. Not only was it a troubled church, it was the biggest church in the world. And it was his first time to ever serve as a pastor. So Paul had to say to him, I beseech you, I beg you, parakaleo, I plead with you to take this position. But he was also very direct with Timothy about the challenge. Because this word parakaleo, the word beseech, was also used to describe the commander of a troop of soldiers. And before the soldiers were sent out to battle, he would charge the troops or he would beseech the troops. He would talk to them about the realities of war and the glories of victory. He would talk to them about bloodshed and stir them up before they were sent out into battle. And that word can also be translated in this way. So in one sense, he says to Timothy, the task before you is great. The battle is going to be terrific. And I'm pleading with you to take this responsibility which Timothy accepted. 
And he said, as I besought you, I pleaded with you to abide at Ephesus that you might charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Other doctrine is the word heterodidaskalos, and I'm going to write it down so you can see it. I'm going to spell it in English because you won't be able to read it in Greek. And if I spell it in English, you can take notes. It is the word hetero. Do you recognize the word there? Then it is the word didaskalos. Sorry, I was writing in Greek. Heterodidaskalos. The word hetero is where we get the word heteros. It's where you get the term for a, anybody want to tell me? A heterosexual. It means one of a different kind. The word didaskalos is from the word didasko, and the word didasko means to teach. But when you add this with the word kalos, which describes something that is excellent, you find this is not just teaching, but didaskalos describes superb teaching. It is masterfully taught. So whatever these elders were teaching that was false, they had packaged it in a very slick way. Paul said it's not just teaching, but it is excellently presented. The problem is, it is heteros. It's teaching of a different kind. It's not what I taught you. And so these leaders were using the pulpit to teach false doctrine. Now, that was the problem in the first century. But when you come to chapter 4 and verse 1, the Holy Spirit begins to talk about what's going to happen in the church at the end of the church age. And that would be the period in which we are living. And it says in chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit speaks expressly. The word speak is from the word, anybody know this word? Rhema. However, in this particular case, it is the word retus. And the word retus describes something that is explicit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is speaking so clearly that there is no room for misunderstanding. The Holy Spirit speaks expressly. The Holy Spirit speaks explicitly or without mistake. There is no mistaking what the Holy Spirit is saying in this verse. This word retos leaves no room for misunderstanding. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks clearly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, we've already seen in chapter 1 that when Paul wrote this, they were already having a problem of false doctrine. But now when you come to chapter 4 and verse 1, it's almost as the Holy Spirit says, as if all of this is not challenging enough, let me point my finger 2,000 years into the future and tell you what's going to happen at the very end of the church age. And Paul says, now the Spirit speaks in explicit terms, in unmistakable language, that in the latter times, everybody said latter times, Now, there are two words for latter. There's the word eschatos, and this is where we get the term for eschatology, which is the study of end times, and this would describe the end. Then there's the word husteros, and this word husteros is the word that is used in this text. If we had a chart that showed the end times, saying this is the cross, and this is when the Holy Spirit came, In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, that triggered the church age, which is also called the last days. The last days is a 2,000-year period of time which started with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and will last until the rapture of the church. You still believe in the rapture of the church? Well, the word eschatos describes the very ultimate end. It would describe this period here. However, the word husteros describes what is left of this period. It's not just the last times, but it's the very, very last of the last times. What's left of it? And so the Holy Spirit is pointing his finger all the way into the future and is saying, let me tell you what the end-time church is going to have to deal with. 
And he says, in the latter times, some shall, what does it say? Depart. And if you're taking notes, the word depart is the word planos. And this word planos describes a very slow, methodical departure. Notice it does not say some shall abandon the faith. It doesn't say some shall reject the faith. But it says some shall depart. A very slow, methodical process also used in this text is the word aphistomy, which describes one step away from at a time. A little adjustment is made, then another little adjustment is made, and very slowly, over a very long period of time, this person or this organization or this church has changed their position completely. They didn't outright reject what they were doing. They didn't outright reject the movement of the Spirit or the teaching of the Word, but they made one little adaptation and another little adaptation and another and another and another and another until what they have become is nothing of what they once were. They have departed, not abandoned. They've never claimed to have rejected. But very slowly, very methodically, they begin to change the way they think giving heed to planos, seducing spirits, and doctrines of demons. The word doctrines is the word didaskalia, a form of this word, which means whoever is leading them astray is doing it very masterfully. They've presented an argument that sounds reasonable, and people in the ministry, according to this verse, will begin listening to these arguments, and slowly they will begin to modify the way they operate, modify what they believe, and they will begin stepping away from what they once preached. And in particular, it says they will depart from what? The faith. The faith has a definite article. That definite article tells us they're not stepping away from faith in general, but that definite article means they are stepping away from the faith or that body of teaching which we call the doctrine of the church. And if you look at what is happening today in culture, what is happening in the courts? Praise God for the new election. I believe the Lord has given us a reprieve. But even if you just take the example of the new view on sexuality, how the culture is changing, and we find that people are beginning to be impacted by culture, and unfortunately, even many people in the ministry are beginning to change the way they see things, and they're trying to adapt to the culture that is around them, and very slowly, methodically, they're beginning to change what they believe and becoming more inclusive of some things they should not even be inclusive of. If the Bible's not inclusive of it, neither should we be inclusive of it. So now Paul has described what Timothy is dealing with. He's got to take charge. He's got to charge those that are teaching heterodidaskalos, masterful teachings, but teachings of a different kind. They're wrong. They're not to be accepted. Now he says to us, chapter 4, verse 1, the Holy Spirit speaks retus explicitly, unmistakably, that in what is left of time, some will begin to slowly modify themselves as they step away from the sound, clear teaching of Scripture and give heed to the Greek word prosecho, which means to turn their attention in another way. Seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. All right, that's the problem. What is the solution? And the solution for those of us in the ministry is found in verse 6. How do we respond to a culture that is changing? How do we respond to people who no longer know the Bible? And by the way, when you travel across the country, it's very evident that biblical illiteracy is growing in this nation. It's become very profound. 
the stories which we talk about freely and assume that everyone understands what we're talking about, many people today don't even know the characters of the Bible. They have no idea whom we're talking about. The church has changed radically. How many of you know that that's, the church is in a process of evolving into something that's not so good? So when you come to 1 Timothy 4, verse 6, Paul gives to Timothy and to us what is our responsibility in a changing climate. And in verse 6, he says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. I just wonder how many of you use a King James Version. Can I see your hands or maybe a new King James Version? Well, then your translation says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things. However, if you have a newer translation, it might say, if you suggest these things to the brothers. <laughs> but to be honest, the newer translation and the King James translation both miss the point altogether. The word that is used here is the word hupo tithemi. If you're taking notes, write that down. The word hupo means under or underneath, and the word tithemi is a foundational word. It means to lay, place, or position a foundation. To lay place or position a foundation. And when you drop this word into verse 6 where it is used, rather than say, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, the Greek actually says, if you hupotithemi the brethren. A literal translation is, if you crawl under hupo the brethren. And tithemi, put a foundation underneath them. You will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And here Paul gives us our assignment. Our assignment is to be crawling under the lives of people and laying a foundation underneath their lives. Now, when you normally build a house, what do you build first? You build the foundation, and then you build on top of the foundation. That's how you naturally build a house. But that is not true in the house of God. In the house of God, you preach a message to unsaved people. They all come to Christ. Peter says immediately, instantly, they are living stones. But however, these living stones who are assembled together by the Spirit have no foundation. They don't know what is the Bible. They don't know what is doctrine. They don't know anything. So you have the structure of people, but they have no foundation. And so our responsibility is to hupo, come underneath the brethren, and tithemi, put a foundation underneath them. That is our responsibility. When I view my responsibility in Moscow and the many people who come to our church who are from a communist background or an atheistic background, my responsibility is not to build a ministry that impresses them or to do something that builds our reputation, but our call is to prop up those people, crawl underneath those people, and put a foundation underneath their life that they can build upon. And that is all of our responsibility. And furthermore, this word hupotithemi is continuous, which means this is not something you do once. This is something you're called to do now and for the rest of your ministry. You will be hupo crawling under the brethren, tithemi laying a foundation under their life. Every time someone new comes to Christ, your responsibility is to put a foundation underneath their life. When you work with people in their marriage, you're trying to put a foundation underneath their life. This is our calling. And in fact, Paul says, if you hupotithemi the brethren, if you come under them and lay a foundation underneath them, you will be a what? What kind of minister? A good minister. The word good is the word kalos. And the word kalos describes something that is superior. 
And in fact, it was used to describe connoisseurs of art. People that had an eye for exceptionally fine artwork. And they would walk through a gallery and they would observe all the wonderful pieces of art and appreciate all of them so much, but finally they would come to the very end of the gallery and there would be one piece of art so outstanding that it would totally captivate their attention. That is this word kalos. But now we find it used in the context of verse 6, which tells us Jesus is not an art connoisseur, but Jesus is a minister connoisseur. And he walks through the church. And he looks at this minister and appreciates what they're doing. And he looks at another and another and another and another. But when Jesus sees a minister that is hupotithemi, under the church, laying a foundation under people's lives, this is so callous, it is so excellent that Jesus stops and it totally captivates his attention. And in fact, it says that if you do this, you'll be a good minister of, everybody say of, the Greek can be translated just like, just like Jesus Christ. So you have to think for a moment about the ministry of Jesus. What did he do? With no one else's help, Jesus was given to the earth. Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life to lay a foundation underneath the earth, underneath the people. Jesus gave everything that he had to give. And when we give ourselves in this fashion, it makes us most like Jesus Christ is what Paul is saying. But something very important in addition is he uses the word minister. Well, that's what this is. This is a minister's conference. What is this word minister? Are you ready to write down some things? The word minister, there are three words for minister in the New Testament. And all three of these refer to who we are. The first word, and you should write this down if you're taking notes, is the word doulas. And this word doulos can be translated minister. It can be translated servant. It can even be translated as the word slave. Paul, Peter, James, and Jude all use this word to describe themselves. And this particular word, dolos, translated servant, slave, or minister, describes one who is totally swallowed up in the will of someone else. If you are the dolos of Christ Jesus, it means you have surrendered total control of your life to someone else. And this is a New Testament word also translated as the word minister. Secondly, in the New Testament, there is the word huparetas. And we find this word in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. And 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says, if you want to know how to think of us, think of us as the ministers of Christ. If you read it in Greek, it says, think of us as the huperetas. Well, what does the word huperetus mean? It is actually the word for an under rower. And in fact, if you have a newer translation, it might even say under rower. And it described the men who were assigned to the bottom galley of ships and who became the engines of ships. And they were assigned to a bench with four other slaves, so there were five to a bench. Now, you know, you may wonder, why did Paul use these words? But there are such pictures in all of these words. Here we have a picture of fivefold ministry. Five of them on a bench working together. And a big oar was placed into their hands, and their job was to row, row, row the boat. And they became the engines of the ship. 
So you could stop right there and say, Paul was saying, if you want to think of us, think of us as the engines of the ship because we do what we do. The body of Christ is moving forward. Well, of course, the problem is all the passengers on deck. They're along for a free ride and often complain that the church is not growing fast enough. Why haven't we reached the vision yet? Why aren't we moving a little quicker? And the truth is if they would get off the deck and get in the bottom with the rest of us and grab an oar, we could do a whole lot, a whole lot quicker. Also interesting is the fact that these servants who held the oar were chained to their positions. That chain was a commitment. If that boat sprung a leak, the passengers on deck could get on other little boats and sail away. But if you were down under, you were going to go down with the ship. And likewise, when you are the head of a church or a ministry, you bear a responsibility like the passengers do not bear. If the ship goes down, you're going to go down with the ship. And therefore, when the ministry is in trouble, what do we do? We begin to move that thing like a ski boat. We do everything we can to keep this ship moving because we are not going to go down with the ship. And I think it's also worth noting that the bottom galley of the ship is where all the ship rats lived. The ship rats didn't bother the passengers. But they had a way of snuggling up close to the men that were doing all of the work, the men that were rowing the boat. And I hate to say it, but there is a rodent community in the church. And they have a way of getting close to those that are giving everything they have to keep the boat moving. And Paul uses this word, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, it is translated as the word minister. But then here, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, the word minister is the word diakonos. Anybody recognize that word? Where else do we see that word? Acts chapter 6, where it is translated as the word deacon. The word deacon, or the word diakonos, is the word dia. If you're taking notes, the word dia means on behalf of, and the word konas describes the community. And when you put these two words together, you find that if you are a minister, because here it is translated as the word minister, you are one whose life has been given on behalf of the community. And where Paul borrowed this word is very important. It was a technical word which was used in the local communities to describe a particular class of individuals who were given to a community and their job was to serve, and for the rest of their lives, they were to serve the community. It was not a high-ranking position, but it was a service position. And this is the word which, Timothy, which Paul uses, speaking to Timothy, when he says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, or now you understand the Greek actually says, if you hupotithemi, if you come under the brethren and lay a foundation underneath them, you will be a superior diakonos of Jesus Christ, one whose life has been given lock, stock, and barrel. You're not just a person who has gifts, but you are the gift itself given to the church. We are not our own. We are ones who have been given. And Paul says, if you serve in this way, you'll be a good minister. What does it say? Of Jesus Christ, which will be better translated, you will be a good minister just like Jesus Christ. Then he says, nourished up, in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Nourished up is the Greek word entrefo, which means to taste, to eat, 
to swallow, to digest, to take it in completely. And Paul says, for you to be this kind of minister, there are two things that are essential in your spiritual diet. Words of faith, and here the word faith is used in a more general sense. Things that build your faith. You need to feed on the Word of God. You need to feed on those things that will build your faith. But in addition to that, Paul says, you need to be nourished up in the words of doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. You know, for some reason, people get the idea that doctrine is something that is boring. But in fact, doctrine is essential for our lives. We are the byproduct of what we believe. And unfortunately, in most churches, if you were to give a doctrine test to the congregations, the congregations could not pass a doctrine test, especially the younger generation. They're growing up in churches where they hear very masterful motivational messages and where there is tremendous music. But here's the problem with that. You can't build your life on music. Music is wonderful. Lights are great. All these special effects, I have no problem with that. But when push comes to shove, you're not going to build your life on music. You're going to build your life on what? The Word of God. It is that Word which is going to sustain you. It's that Word which is going to carry you. And when all we do is give special effects and music to our congregations, we are doing wrong to our congregations. We have a responsibility. Hupo, to prop them up, crawl underneath them, antithemy, lay a foundation underneath their lives. And if a false wind of doctrine comes along that blows them off the foundation and then they come back home after a period of time, guess what? We are to not resentfully serve them, but all over again we are to prop them up, crawl underneath them, lay another foundation underneath their life. The Greek here is continuous. This is our destiny. And I'll tell you that if you recognize it is your call and your destiny, it'll make it a lot easier for you in the ministry. Because when you struggle with what you're doing and you think that you're giving too much and that they're asking too much of you, there'll always be a part of you that's not surrendered to do it. But if you recognize this is your calling for the rest of your life, you're going to do this, then you won't resent it when you're called upon to do it again and again and again. It's really just surrendering to the call. In our own church, we are very serious about the way that we present our ministry. We're very serious about music, the various outreaches of our church. And I believe we should be excellent in everything that we do. But there is nothing more important than the foundation which we're placing underneath people's lives because that's what's going to carry them through every storm and that's what's going to give us the ability to endure as a church or a ministry regardless of what the season brings. And that's what was on my heart today. I want you to just put your hand on your heart, and I want to pray for you. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you have called us to serve in the final days of the end times. Lord, we declare and believe that we are equipped for the task. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to put people on a solid foundation. Lord, that you would help us to stay focused on the goal and not unduly influenced by the culture and the society that is around us. We thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to do this job. We give you thanks for all of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. If you would like to receive more information about Rick Renner Ministries, please visit us at renner.org. Start your day on the path towards success and peace as you discover something new from God's Word with Rick Renner's outstanding devotional, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. You may purchase a copy of Sparkling Gems on our website or 
check us out on iTunes. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. With your support, we will continue to teach, strengthen, and rescue lives in need. Together, we can make a difference.